at the end, but you can keep writing in the document. And then at the end of my presentation, I'll, I'll share all of the questions for me, Elena and, and Giovanni. So today I'm going to be talking about extraction from a synchrotron. Now, in many ways, this is similar to injection in terms of the physical components, but the techniques are a bit different. So extraction is extremely important because there is no point in doing any of this unless you can get the beam out. And the beam needs to come out with very good quality so that it is suitable to be used for a medical machine, which is why the extraction part uh, is very important. So what properties are we looking for when we have a beam for ion therapy? Uh, because the quality depends very strongly on extraction. We need the beam to be continuous on the order from one second to 30 seconds. This is important because we're going to be doing active scanning and passive scanning, uh, which I believe you've been told about already. And this is happening over minutes. You can't scan the beam if you've got like a, a millisecond or microsecond beam. It needs to be slow and continuous. We want to have changes in energy and we want this to happen very quickly. This is because we want to vary the treatment energy to change the dose depth. The more powerful the particle is, the further it can go. And it means we can really have a 3D scan of the tumor rather than just a 2D one. And the most important factor, the beam has to be of stable intensity. Each time we fire the beam, we need to predict exactly what it looks like, exactly where it's going. This needs to be consistent and reliable. If sometimes we get loads of um, intensity and sometimes we get none at all, then, then this just isn't suitable at all for medical purposes. There are a few other desirable properties. We want the beam to be stopped very quickly if something goes wrong for safety. We would like to have the option of fast dose delivery for flash, which you've heard a lot of this week. And we would like to have the option of multiple ion species maybe even all at once in the same ring, but these don't have quite so much to do with the extraction. So I won't be talking about them very much today. So types of extraction, we can extract the beam fast, really quickly. Uh, the beam is going very quickly and we just get it all out, all in one go, the entire beam is deflected. And this takes about a microsecond. So it, it's very too quick for our purposes for medical machines but it's very commonly used in most accelerators, especially the LHC transfer line. So the booster to the proton synchrotron, to the super proton synchrotron, to the LHC, this is all happening all in one go via uh, a fast extraction. We do have this moderate metering ground that we're not going to talk about too much today, but essentially it involves splitting the beam into five or six up to 10 parts, and then shooting those parts, those islands out uh, one by one but uh, this is a very specific requirement that not too many accelerators do. But today we're really going to be focused on slow extraction. And when we say slow, we mean really slow. This is millions or thousands of millions of turns of the accelerator. And each time it turns, we get a little bit of the beam out. The beam is being very gradually shaved uh, each time it goes past. And this is used in all medical synchrotrons. Uh, slow extraction is essential for the, the reasons I mentioned beforehand. So before I can talk about how we do slow extraction, first we need to consider the components that are required. So Eleanor already introduced the electrostatic septum. It's a partition. It's defined as a partition which separates two field regions. So if this is our charged particle beam as a circle in red, in this region here, there's no field at all. The particle just keep going. And in this region here, it sees a uniform force and it gets deflected. Uh, the, the point here is a foil, a septum foil. And this has to be really thin because if this beam is being implemented on this foil, it's lost. And we really need to minimize our beam loss. And then here we'd have the electrode that is providing the force which deflects the beam. So if this is the kind of transverse direction, we can look up on top of the beam and we can see that most of it goes forward, but then a very small amount of it gets shaved off and it gets deflected. And so, uh, for example, for the PIMS machine, it would be on the order of a millirads deflection, so a very small angle. And this is because we can't afford to have too strong a field because of how thin this foil is. So we want a really, really small deflection 
just to get a little bit of that beam. And this bit of the beam here continues forwards and it meets the magnetic sub. Four magnets. You have a north, you have a south, and we'll typically have a thin one and then later on a thick one. And these provide stronger kicks that take the beam way out towards the extraction lines to be fully removed. So if this is our beam line, this beam is the one that's received no force, it just keeps going round. But this is our beam that's been a little bit deflected and it goes through the mag dipole magnet and it receives an even larger kick to leave the ring. There are a few more components uh, which you may uh, hear about uh, when considering extraction. We have bumpers. So if your particle is coming along, this gray line here is the bumper magnet and it brings it closer to where the electric septum might be. And this means that if you don't want to extract, your beam just keeps going and it's really far away from the septum. But when you do want to extract, then you can turn these kickers on, bring it a bit closer, have a bit of particles lost, and then bring it back to circle around the beam normally. And then there are kicker magnets, which Eleanor mentioned, and it just gives you one magnetic kick, the entire beam is lost, and it goes to the, say, magnetic septum to be kicked out. So how would this look like for fast extraction? So we want to remove the beam, say, just in one turn, uh, as an example. So this in red is our beam and it's circulating through normally on axis. We introduce our kicker, we turn it on and the beam gets deflected by a very small angle. We introduce the larger magnetic septum, which gives us a substantially larger angle and then the beam leaves the machine. So that's the kind of simple aspect of extraction. To extract slowly, uh, it's a bit more difficult, so we'll take the time to kind of understand this fully. For slow extraction, we purposefully make the beam unstable. We want to shake it up so that we're gradually just extracting a few particles each turn. To do this, uh, Eleanor mentioned for injection, you have a kind of quarter resonance so that it, it rotates by, by a quarter each time. Here we're putting it on a third order resonance, which means we have a third integer tune. I believe uh, Marius mentioned tune beforehand. This means that the particle returns to its original position every three turns. Particle will start off here, after one turn, jump over here, next turn, jump over here, and then finally returns back to its original position. And when it does this, it forms a triangular shape. So the beam at the center with the small amplitude, it's, it's very circular, and the larger you go out, the more triangular the beam forms. And once we get to this stage, we introduce higher order fields, which shape this instability into the form that we want to get the particles to come out. So what is the magnet that we use to shape this instability? It's called a sextapole, which I believe may have been mentioned before. It essentially just has six poles, as an example of this image here, which I believe is from the SES. Now, if you look at the phase space of the beam, so this is the position on this axis, over here is the angle. And this is what the magnet is doing. Uh, blue is like an attractive effect, red is a repulsive effect. And so in the center, it's fairly circular. The larger you go out, it forms a, tri a triangle which is stable. And then beyond this stable triangle, you get unstable regions where the particles can leave through these channels here, which are called separatrices or a separatrix. And so this is kind of uh, provides an envelope for a stable beam. So let's see what happens if we actually place a couple of particles in this uh, di distribution that the magnet gives and see what happens to it. So what happens is, for example, this is the electric septum and beyond this line, the particles receive an angular kick, which is what these red particles here show. And I have an animation to represent this. We go back to the start. So first the triangle forms, the triangle gets really big and then these lines form and the particles follow down this line until they meet the septum and then they get, they receive this kick that comes them out. And so in this animation, um, it looks very smooth because I'm only taking every third turn. So the tri the, if I showed the intermediate turns, then you'd see a lot of jumping around of the particles. But this is showing the gradual motion every three turns. 
Now, can you notice that at the end, we have this stable triangle which remains there. These particles aren't being removed. So what we want to do is we need to excite these particles. They're currently in the center in this stable triangle. We need to jump them out outside in order so that they can be extracted. There's a number of methods we can use to do this. So one is called Betatron core. And this is where we change the momentum of the beam and we actually change the shape of the triangle. So initially all the particles are stable, they're within the triangle, they're not going anywhere. We increase the momentum of the beam, the triangle shrinks, and then any particles that are outside this triangle are going to gradually over time get extracted. And, it, and it's a very kind of smooth process. The, beam, the triangle gets smaller, the beams gradually get lost. And this is a very stable way of extracting the beam. Um, however, it does take some time because with each new energy, you have to set up the triangle again and shrink it. We have radio frequency knockout excitation, and this is increasing the amplitude of the particles. We introduce some stochastic noise, and so any particles that are in here will jump out, just go straight out of the triangle and leave. And this is very good because it can happen very quickly, and it means if we're changing energy quite a lot, it's fine, we can still keep on extracting. So it's, it's very rapid. And so a lot more experiments are starting to use this RF knockout excitation. So what does this look like? Finally, if you can see this animation here, we have the same effect as before, but you can see that there's no stable triangle forming. Instead, the motion is very continuous. The particles keep going, keep moving. And uh, so last time, by the time we were at 500 tons, it was just a core triangle. Here we're getting to 500 tons and the beam is, is still being lost. So this animation runs up to thousands of tons and even then we're still receiving particles, they're still being lost. Um, and they're still going towards the septum and receiving this kick. Uh, so what's the kind of goal here in doing slow extraction? Well, the measure of importance is called beam spill. It's also known as particle flux. It describes number of particles per time period. So this is what we want to avoid. If uh, the particles are being lost kind of all at once and then nothing, you get these peaks, you get these troughs. And, and it means if we're giving this beam to the patient, we can never be sure whether the particle is going to receive all of the intensity or none of the intensity. It's really very unreliable. We want to design our way in such a way that it's very, very smooth. We have this gradual um, kind of, we know what the intensity is as it goes on. So to conclude, for extraction of medical machines, we need specific techniques to get the beam out slowly. We purposefully make the beam unstable, gradually extract a few particles from the beam every time it turns. We use sextopoles to shape this resonance and form separatrices. There are lots of methods to excite the beam into higher resonances, and we use septum magnets to divert the beam towards the extraction line. Thank you for listening, and I welcome any questions. Uh, so what I'll do now is I will share the documents. Um, I see that I have four questions and we have about five minutes. Um, uh, Rebecca, you can uh, take all the questions for the whole uh, session. Please leave it uh, there and then uh, people will uh, uh, answer. So okay. start from, from your questions and then we will uh, go higher up, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. The material that the foil is made, I don't know this very well. I think Eleanor might know this because they use the foil as an injection. So I'll leave that one to her. Um, slow extraction is used for medical purposes because we want to very gradually scan the beam across the tumor, and you can only scan the beam if it's going slowly. So it will take maybe 10 to 30 seconds of consistent beam. And you can't do this with any other beam because you get all the beam in one go and, and a huge dose, uh, which has some benefits with flash therapy, but here we want it to go slowly. Um, the Noise, um, if you mean the noise for the RF knockout, then that's what we want. We want this noise because we want to excite these particles out. Uh, but there's also in the flux, you saw, you know, there's still some up and down, there's some noise there. Um, that's kind of called rippling and it comes from all sorts of sources. You have power converters, you have the magnets, you've got essentially everything in the accelerator gives some noise to the particles. And the how to deal with that is an entirely 
new presentation of its own. There's a lot of techniques that you should try and balance to reduce this rippling effect. Um, question four. Yes, so these trails aren't at all wasted. As I mentioned, the GIF I showed only showed every three turns. So these other two trails, these particles are jumping from one trail into the next and being lost. And, and so you can't see that bit because, I mean, as an animation, it's just kind of vibrating all over the place. You can't see the overall coherent effect. Uh, so no, these trails aren't wasted at all. Instead, um, this isn't X, Y, you know, this isn't the actual space. It is angle position. So it's a bit less intuitive to work with, but in the next turn, those particles are the ones that are being extracted. Um, you just don't see it in the animation. Um, Shall we move on to Eleanor? And if you don't mind, I'll move this question over. Okay, so even though it was already mentioned, can you please explain what is beam loss? Where do particles go? Do we get side radiation? Yes, so you can lose the beam at different places. Um, if you do not control them, you lose it, you lose them on the on the vacuum chamber of the of your uh, of your accelerator, so on the beam pipe, and depending on the energy, indeed, uh, we can have different effects. So if the energy is low, the radiation will be very very small and uh, almost uh, um, yeah neglectable, if you like. If the energy of the beam is uh, higher, you can start having radiation, but most important. Uh, um, you produce secondary radiation, so neutrons. Neutrons uh, get a, that activate uh, the, the the beam chamber, and that's why in some location around the ring uh, you you cannot really access them. Uh, even uh, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, there are ways to control where you get losses, and one of the way is that you uh, restrict on purpose the uh, the beam pipe. So you create uh, some uh, aperture restriction, and therefore you preferably lose the beam there. And there you can uh, uh, force it, it makes it uh, easier to deal with. Uh, can you please describe the requirements of matched beam and what happens if the beam is not exactly, exactly matched? Okay, so if the beam is not exactly matched, it happens what uh, what I showed you in these uh, in these uh, plots. Uh, the beam starts filamenting and the emittance at the end will be much larger than uh, what it was before. How to match the beam? You use quadruples. Quadruples in the transfer line um, have the power to change the orientation of this ellipse according to their focusing strength. And therefore you can achieve a matched beam uh, at injection or everywhere else that you, that you want to have it. Is electric or magnetic septum preferred? Uh, it depends. Electric septum gives a very small kick, as you saw from uh, Rebecca's slide as well. Magnetic septum uh, can uh, give a larger kick. However, the septum itself, it's uh, um, thicker. So you also, again, lose particles on it. So you better start with an electric septum, which is very, very thin. And then you go for the further steps uh, with magnetics. Is there a dependence between beam loss and energy or particle? Yeah, probably it's done. Uh, you said you mostly use multi-injection techniques. Why it is the case? Is it more efficient? So um, if uh, you inject one turn and you cannot get the intensity that you want it to, uh, then you are obliged to inject uh, multi-turns. So it's like, um, um, yeah, when you, uh, so you want to store more ions in your ring. Uh, so the easiest would be just to have one bunch injecting and that's it. But if you need twice the intensity or three times or even 10 times the intensity, you, you inject, uh, your injection lasts more than one turn in the ring. So this is called multi, multi, multi turn injection. What are the problems using charge exchange injection? Okay, I had uh, no time to discuss it and it was not really meant. Um, when you have charge exchange, you normally have uh, uh, this set of uh, bending magnets which form a chicane for both the circulating beam and the injected beam. 
Uh, this uh, is uh, unfortunately valid only for one ion species. Uh, so if you have a very uh, specific synchrotron which inject, uh, let's say, only carbon ions, uh, then you can have it. Or in the CERN booster, you have only protons, you can have it. Uh, however, if you want to have a, a, an accelerator, a medical accelerator, which can provide protons, carbon, helium, oxygen, whatever else, then you have to design a different trajectory for any of the species. And therefore, you, you, you cannot afford to have different uh, injection sections. So you are obliged to use the multi turn injection. Uh, and finally, what is the material from which the foil is made? Uh, oh, it depends uh, for the electric septum or can be molyb molybdenum or, uh, or, or any other. So yeah, I hope uh, it answered everything. Otherwise, do not hesitate to contact me. So uh, come to, can you hear? Yes, yes, I guess so. Uh, I think I answered already the first questions. Can we make even smaller linas? Yes, I mean it depends on the on, on the scopes, and uh, for example, for electron linux, you might have uh, meter long linux in the in the radiotherapy head of, of the machine, so they can be made very very small. They don't reach very very high energy energies. Even for ion and heavy ion linux, uh, uh, of course you can you can you cannot do miracles for the energy. So uh, the, the shorter it is, the uh, the, the smaller the energy that you can achieve. Uh, of course, you can also increase the frequency of the LINAC so that your, your lambda is small and the beta lambda is small, so the length of each uh, drift section is small, so you make it smaller. But of course, you also uh, can uh, accelerate a smaller uh, current in a, in a high frequency LINAC, so it is, it is a matter of, uh, of, of needs and uh, uh, compromises. What is the metal used to reduce the heat produced from the energy of the electrons uh, uh, in the linear accelerators? Uh, well, I, I don't know if I if, if I catch the the meaning of the of the question, but uh, the, in, in indeed in general uh, metals that you use for both uh, uh, electrons and uh, and uh, heavy ion Linux is uh, a copper, which is a very good uh, thermal conductor that can, can be machined uh, very, very easily. Uh, indeed, it is for both uh, ion species. Now, nowadays, there are uh, ideas of, uh, uh, of also taking advantages of uh, uh, very cold, uh, of very cold copper in order to, in, to improve the properties of, uh, of the resonators um, of the Linux, but there are, they are very, very new ideas. So I'd say that copper is the standard for, for all of them. I think that's all. Okay, great. Then uh, I think we are even on time answering uh, the questions. And uh, we deserve a coffee break. Uh, thanks uh, to all the speakers of uh, the morning uh, session. And uh, we reconvene uh, at uh, 11 to see what happens uh, with uh, uh, what the accelerators deliver. <laughs> Thank you very much. See you later. <laughs>